Well, I'm glad to be here with, this mor- uh, with you this morning to, to worship Jesus and to proclaim the truth of his word through song. And now in this time as we come before his word. For those of you who are joining us for your first time, welcome. My name's Dan. I'm one of the pastors here. For those of you who are used to being around here, I have a special word that I'm supposed to give you. Uh, that is that Eric is okay. <laughs> Eric is all right. Uh, he, he wanted me specifically to point that out today because apparently, like a couple months ago, Eric was gone for two Sundays in a row and you guys had to deal with Nick and I preaching. And apparently throughout like that Sunday and the week to follow, people were like, hey man, what's going on? We haven't seen you in a couple of weeks. Are, are you okay? So number one, Eric is not backslidden. I feel like that's an important, <laughs> important point for us to make this morning. Eric's not backslidden. And then he said, when he finally got back here, some of you asked him, how's your vacation? He doesn't get those either. So, so Eric is not backslidden. He's not on a sunny beach somewhere sipping margaritas. He is uh, actually at another church in Genesee County. Uh, he's been asked to share again about the ministry of One Life for Life to find more churches to partner with us to end abortion now. And uh, so that's where he was last time. That's where he is today. So you don't need to pull out your phone. You don't need to be texting him and, and asking him how his vacation is. Or what. Actually, you know what? You should. I think that'd actually be really funny. <laughs> He's probably up there like looking at his phone for notes and he'll be like, oh, oh what? All right. So I think that'd be really funny. So actually, if you would go ahead and, and do that, that'd be, that'd be awesome. All right, let's move on. So this morning is a really exciting morning because we begin our brand new sermon series titled Unashamed. And in this series, we're going to be working our way verse by verse through the letter of Romans. This is a huge undertaking, right? We're going to, Romans is like the greatest theological letter uh, ever. And uh, so we're going to spend quite a bit of time going through that these next couple of months. Well, actually, not next couple of months, probably the better part of a year, uh, if I'm being honest. Um, so in this, Romans is said to be the fullest, plainest, and grandest explanation of the gospel in the entire Bible. And in the first half of Romans, what we'll see over the next several months, in the first half, we see the gospel explained. And then in the second half of Romans, we will see the gospel then applied. Here's what some of the reformers had to say about Romans. John Calvin said, It is worthy not only that every Christian should know it word for word by heart, but also that he should occupy himself with it every day as the daily bread of the soul. William Tinsdale, he's the one who first translated our Bibles into English, who was ultimately martyred for doing so. He said, Romans is the principal and most excellent part of the New Testament in the light and way unto the whole of Scripture. Lastly, Martin Luther considered Romans to be the chief part of the New Testament. He said it's truly the purest gospel. In fact, it was Martin Luther's teaching on Romans throughout throughout 1516 and 1517 that really marked the start of the Protestant Reformation in 1517. While there were a small sect of people that were trying to reform uh, the Catholic Church, up to that point it was really to no avail. There was no success in the majority of the Christian world in the 1500s, thus was still Roman Catholic. That being said, the book of Romans has undoubtedly changed the Christian world as we know it more than anything else in the last 500 years. And if you're unfamiliar with who Martin Luther was, The story goes like this. Luther had just finished his master's degree. He had begun studying law. And like most law students, he absolutely hated it. So Martin Luther went back and he had this time where he was spending with his parents. And on his way back to school, this great thunderstorm, this lightning storm came. And lightning struck right beside him. And it said that it it, it threw him to the ground. So he thought that he was going to die. He was fearing for his life. So he cried out to St. Anne. And he, and he pretty much said, if you'll spare my life, I will become a monk. And given the fact that he wasn't that big on law school to begin with, he, uh, he left that behind. And he actually followed through on his vow to God that he would become a monk. Contrary to his parents' wishes and all the money, I'm sure, that they invested into 
his law degree. And Martin Luther, once he became a monk, he struggled. He really struggled with his own sinfulness. He really struggled with the fact that he felt like he couldn't overcome this sin. He was going to confession so much that the priests and that his professors, like they actually got so annoyed with him that they sent him to the University of Wittenberg. So like, well, he, he's driving us crazy here. Maybe he'll be a better Bible teacher than he will be a monk. And so Luther goes and he starts teaching the Bible and he starts studying and teaching through Romans in 1516 and in 1517. And it was through this process that he came across Romans 1.17, which we're going to see this morning. And it reads, The righteous shall live by faith. Luther concluded that salvation comes through faith, not works, not through prayer, not through fasting or vigils or pilgrimages or relics or giving to the poor, sacraments or any action that a person can take. We can't ever be good enough. Through our actions to merit salvation, we can only have faith, sola fide. That is, faith alone justifies us before God. And this is what led Martin Luther to nailing the 95 Theses to the Roman Catholic Church door. This marked the start of the Reformation. To be saved, we need nothing but to place our faith in Jesus. It's not faith plus works, it's faith alone. And that sure is good news for sinners like us, isn't it? I don't know about you, but I've tried to clean myself up and I only make the mess bigger, right? We, we try and clean the stain and it only sets it in even deeper. But I mentioned that in the second half of Romans, so that's the first half, right? We see the gospel applied. We are justified by faith alone. But then in the second half, we see the gospel applied. So this begs the question, is a letter that was written in AD 57 in Corinth to the Church of Rome, a time and place that's much different than America in 2019, is it still relevant to us today? Here's some contemporary issues that are touched on in Romans that we will see over the next several months. Enthusiasm and evangelism, whether homosexual relationships are natural or unnatural, whether we can still uh, believe in unfashionable concepts such as God's wrath and propitiation, the, historic, the history of Adam's fall and the origin of human death, what are the fundamental means to living a holy life, the place of the law and of the spirit in Christian discipleship, the distinction between assurance and presumption, the relation between divine sovereignty and human responsibility in salvation, the tension between ethnic identity and the solidarity of the body of Christ, relations between church and state, the respective duties of each individual citizen and the uh, body politic, and how to handle difference of opinion with others in the community of faith. Does that sound like it's something that could be relevant for us today? Right? The scriptures are timeless. God's word is timeless. But let's go before him now. Before we get into this text, let's go before him again in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for your word, that by it we may know you. Lord, your word tells us that you existed in perfect community. You had no need for anything else. Yet you chose to love us. And God, you chose to create the world around us. And you stretched out the skies. You poured out the seas. You established a dry land. You made the animals. You made the plants. You formed us from the dust. But we wanted to be counted equal with you. We rebelled against you. Adam and Eve rebelled against you. And we have followed in that. We've taken the good gifts that you have given us and we've made them God gifts. We've taken these gifts and made them gods in and of themselves, Lord. And your word says that that has made us dead in transgressions and sins. We needed a Savior. And because you loved us before the foundation of the world, you sent this Jesus to live the life that we couldn't live, to die the death that we deserved to die. And now we know with full confidence, as we just sang, if we are trusting you, we stand here holy and blameless. God, may our hearts rest in that now as we come in here as people who struggle still with real sin. Lord, your grace is enough. Your grace has covered us. So God, I pray that this morning 
that you would use your word to change us. God, would you use your word to draw us in? Lord, would you soften our hard hearts? Would you open our deaf ears? Would you turn our eyes from self to you? God, your word is the power unto salvation. So Lord, may your word go forth this morning. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I invite you to go ahead and stand with me if you're able, and we will read as is our customary anymore. We stand to read. I usually forget every time. So I remember this. I'm actually put it down here. It said, make everyone stand. So if Eric asked, y'all stood. In Romans 1, we read, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among the nations, including you who are called to belong to Christ, or Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation to both Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. If you've been around here long at all, you know that that is a whole heck of a lot of scripture for us to try and get through in one sitting, right? Normally we take like a few verses and we work through them. And here we have 17 of them. Throughout this week, I really wrestled with that. I struggled with it. So I started looking up and seeing what other people had done. And I stumbled upon the Desiring God website and saw it took John Piper 13 sermons to get through these 17 verses. 13 sermons. And uh, I, I felt like that would probably be sufficient as I was working through this, but I want us to be able to finish it before Jesus returns. And so this morning, <laughs> I think I found the best way to possibly break it down for us. And I got to warn you, it's probably going to be a roller coaster ride. There's so much here. We can't hit everything as in depth as I'd like to. So we may be going up real steep, and then we may drop down real fast and then pick it up again. Uh, but just try and track with me if you could. So there's a lot going on here. Is anyone else like me that like when you get to an introduction in a book, you just want to like skip over it? I'm glad I'm not the only one uh, because actually here's the funny thing. I'm super OCD about like non-biblical books. Like if I get like, like I was reading commentaries this week and I read the introduction and all those. But when it comes to the Bible and like I read stuff like this or like a genealogy with a bunch of names that I don't, I don't even know these people, but I can't even pronounce their names. Or like you get to the book of Leviticus. Like did anybody else give up on their year in a Bible plan when they got to Leviticus? <laughs> like, we're so prone to just want to skip over this stuff, to want to rush through it. But we firmly believe that all Scripture is God breathe, right? It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, and for training in righteousness. So that's why I want to take some time for us to really uh, walk through this as best as we can today. I know, I know it's a lot, but we'll, we'll try and get through it. Um, so 
We're going to spend some time digging through this to see what the Lord has to say. And I'm not really that creative of a person, contrary to like playing music with the band and stuff. Other than that, I don't have really any creativity. So there's going to be three points this morning, and it's literally just the three phases of this introduction. So here we go. Point number one is the introduction. We see that Paul is committed to calling. He's committed to his calling. We see this in verses one through seven. Next, we see thanksgiving. Paul is committed to the people who he's ministering to. That is verses 8 through 15. And then we see the theme for the entire book of Romans, and that is committed to the gospel, verses 16 through 17. So let's jump right into this introduction. This introduction in verses 1 through 17 is a lot different than what we're, we're typically used to Right? Like when we send a, a message to somebody or we send an email or we maybe like do that old school thing where we actually write letters, we, we usually start it with this, right? To so-and-so. And then we fill in whatever the reason is that we're writing for them. And then at the end of it, we put from so-and-so or sincerely so-and-so. But that's not the case here, right? So in the first century, it was, it was customary for them to actually start by introducing themselves and then mentioning who they're addressing and then giving a thanksgiving and then getting to what, whatever it was that, that they needed to write about. And for those of you who may be extra studious, you may have noticed that this introduction from Paul in verses 1 through 7 is a heck of a lot longer than it is in any of his other letters. For instance, Ephesians 1 Paul's introduction is just two short verses. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from our God and Father from the Lord Jesus Christ. And then literally two verses later, he's teaching on election. He's teaching about how God chose us before the foundation of the world. He didn't waste any time whatsoever. So, so why does it take him so long to get into this part here, to get through this introduction. Well, unlike all of Paul's other letters, all Paul's other letters in the Bible were written to churches that he had planted and that needed correction or to pastors that he had discipled, that he had trained up. Whereas with this letter of Romans, Paul didn't start the Roman church. Paul had never even been to Rome. These people had no idea who Paul was. While I'm sure that they had heard things about him in his past days when he was a Pharisee and, and what had happened, by and large, they didn't know who he was. So it was really important in this introduction for him to establish his calling, for him to establish his credentials. That way they knew that he wasn't giving them some counterfeit gospel that was contrary to the gospel that they had received. So that's the purpose of this uh, this long introduction here. And honestly, they don't, historians and scholars alike don't even know exactly how there were churches in Rome at this point. The best inclination that, that anyone has really had is that according to uh, Acts 2.10, when Pentecost came, right? Like when the, when the tongues of fire came down, when, when God poured out his Holy Spirit on people, it said that there was people there from Rome. So the presumption is, is that those people took the gospel back to their land and they established their own church. So needless to say, the reason the introduction in Roman is so long is because God, or is because Paul needed to establish his credentials, who he was and what the gospel was that he preached. For instance, so the way that I'm going to address a complete stranger when I write them is, is a lot different than the way I'm going to address somebody that I know well, right? I've got a friend and his name is Josh. And Josh has been to One Life before. We've been friends for a super long time. Josh uh, has been tracking on social media with our One Life for Life ministry. He loves everything that's going on there. So with our banquet coming up, I just called him. And I said, hey, man, I know your business uh, likes to do things for nonprofits. You want to give us some money and be an underwriter? And he's like, oh, yeah, sure, totally. But if I was addressing like a business owner in the community, someone who I'd never met before, don't you think I would take a little bit more time to establish who I was before asking for something, before asking for any money, right? For them, I may be like, oh, I'm Dan, I'm a pastor at One Life. It's great. Uh, I work with One Life for Life. We have this ministry that serves abortion-minded mothers, that, that gives them crisis uh, situation counseling, that offers help, that offers alternatives. And we've got this banquet coming, you know, and so on and so forth. So who we are addressing 
uh, really changes up how we're going to introduce ourselves to someone. So let's go ahead. Let's start digging through this a little bit verse by verse. And I warned you, like, this is going to seem really drawn out at first. I think these first few things are really important. And then we're just going to speed up and we're probably going to blast right through them. So the first thing we see here is that the author of the letter is Paul. And for most of us, if we've been in the church in a while, we know this dude's whole story. Like there's, there's some people in this room who've, who've been studying the Bible longer than I've been alive, right? But not everybody's there. So I wanted to take a little bit of time and just talk about Paul. Because if we're going to understand this letter, we have to understand that the meaning is determined by the person who wrote it, not us. Like we don't just come at it and go, well, this is what this means to me. The author determines the meaning. So we need to talk about Paul for a second. And we first hear about Paul in Acts 7. Does anybody recall what's, what's going on in Acts 7? So in Acts chapter 7, we're introduced to this guy named Saul. Saul and Paul are the same guy. We don't really know when or why the name changed. There was a bunch of theories. Some of it, one of them was that his name was Paul and Saul. Like one was the first name, one was the middle name. That's weird. I'm not totally sure. But the bottom line is these two people are the exact same person. Acts 13, 9 says Saul, who was also called Paul. All right. Now we've established that. Paul, it says, our first introduction to Paul is at the martyr of the first person in the, in the history of Christian religion. This guy named Stephen was preaching the gospel and they drug him out to stone him. And it says that Paul was there and that Paul approved of the, of the murder. More than that, Paul was holding on to everybody's jackets as they were taking their jackets off to stone this man for his Christian faith. Then after that, Moving on a little bit into chapter 8, we read of how it says that Paul was ravaging the church. So he was literally going house to house, and he was binding people, and he was dragging them off to prison. And so it got to the point where Christians are, Jewish Christians are going, all right, we're, we're going to spread out a little bit because this guy is coming door to door. So what does Paul do? Paul goes and he gets a letter that says he can go to this other city, that says he can go to Damascus to go round these people up and bring them back, potentially to be executed. So this is Paul. This is the guy who's writing this letter. But something changed, didn't it? Paul met Jesus, and he met Jesus in a powerful, powerful way. So, Paul is on his way to Damascus to go to persecute these Christians, right? To bind them up, to take them back. And he literally gets knocked off his high horse. And like Jesus comes down and his glory, his glory is so radiant that it blinds Paul. And he hears a voice say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Paul replies, who are you, Lord? Like, who else is going to blind you with their glory? All that. He's like, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus of whom you are persecuting. So Paul's blind now. They, someone had to help him off the ground. They take him to the city. And God had told this guy named Ananias, like, hey, I've set this guy, Paul, apart. I've set him apart to be an apostle to the Gentiles. I've set him apart to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And so this Ananias guy, right, he's, he's heard a, the, the testimony about Paul. He's heard this guy is going to, out to murder people, and yet you're saying you want him to come to my house and you want me to tell him the truth about the gospel? And God's like, yeah. And so that's what he did. And this is what marks Paul's conversion, where Paul believed on the gospel of Jesus Christ, where he stopped killing and he stopped persecuting Christians. So recap, Paul went from killing Christians to converting people to Christianity. What can we draw from this? The gospel has the power to take a man from killing Christians to converting others to Christianity. The gospel has the power to bring death to life. This is super important for us to remember, especially as we get on later into verses 16 through 17. So the next thing we see, so in verse 1 we see Paul. The next thing we see is a servant of Christ Jesus. The Greek word here used is doulos, which means bondservant or slave. And in America, the word slave has a really negative connotation to it, doesn't it? Because we've seen throughout our history people be enslaved simply because of the color of their skin or, or, 
we still see slavery in the form of human trafficking, right? Like there's all sorts of women and children in this world that, that have been turned to sex slaves. And yet this is the word that Paul uses to describe himself in relation to Jesus. And to Gentiles, that is unbelievers, or not unbelievers, Gentiles, that is not Jews in Rome, this would have been a negative term to them too. Because at this time it's estimated that in, the, in Rome, the majority of people were actually forced slaves. But yet this is what Paul refers to himself as. But that, that term slave says a lot, some, says something drastically different to those who were Jewish. Because servant, bondservant, slave is what, what Abraham was referred to, what Moses was referred to, what David was referred to, what Isaiah was referred to, what the prophets were referred to. They were called servants of the Lord. And as I mentioned, this word really means bondservant. And this was a really common thing in the Old Testament. There was people that had a debt that they couldn't pay off. And so they would become these bond servants. They would become these indentured servants. And what would happen is they would work until whatever their debt was, was paid off. And it was actually really, really common that people were so well taken care of in their time of being a bond servant that they chose to stay in it the rest of their life. They had a place to live that was provided for them. They had, they had uh, food provided for them. And life was so good that when their debt was paid off or at the year of Jubilee after seven years, a lot of times they would choose to still stay. They would start, choose to still stay with their masters. The picture here is God had been so good to Paul, where else could he go? Where else could he be cared for more? So we see Paul, he is a servant of Christ Jesus. The next thing we see is he is called to be an apostle. And this term can sometimes be really confusing because while Paul and the original 12 disciples minus Judas, Judas Iscariot obviously, claim to be apostles, but so do some goofy dudes on TBN wearing $3,000 suits rolling in in Rolls Royces. So what is going on here? Stop laughing at me, Nick. <laughs> I got to bring this up, right? Because this isn't something we talk about a lot. This is a word that we see in Scripture, but then we see other people on TBN. We see people on these billboards with these elaborate hairdos who are claiming to be apostles. And more than that, they... In today's times, these apostles claim to have authority that was equal to those of the apostles in the New Testament. They claim that their words are the words of God, that their words are, are equal with Scripture. They prestige themselves. They put themselves in this place of authority. But what are the biblical qualifications of an apostle? Here's what the Bible lays out. They are somebody who physically saw and witnessed the resurrected Jesus. They were specifically called to their office by the Holy Spirit, and they had the ability to perform signs and wonders. The purpose of their office was to really lay the foundation for the early church, to, to, to take the gospel to the world. 1 Corinthians 15, 8, Paul explains that he was the last chosen apostle. With these words, he said, Last of all, as at one untimely born, he also appeared to me. Speaking of when Jesus called him to be an apostle. It was untimely because everybody else, all the other apostles, witnessed Jesus before his ascension. Whereas Paul, right, God like came down from heaven and blinded him. So he was saying this was at an untimely place, born in an undue time. More than that, when Paul references himself in relation to the other apostles, contrary to what false prophets, false apostles say today, Paul said, I am the least of all the apostles, right? Because he saw the weight of his own sin. He saw that I had been a man that was breathing lies and breathing murder. So this guy who actually had the authority who actually was in the office of apostle, didn't count himself, right? So these are the biblical qualifications of an apostle. There's no more apostles today. I just had to get that out of the way. Like I said, it's not something that gets addressed a lot. 
I promise we're going to get a little quicker with things. I know that's like, I got like 15 minutes left. And uh, we're like eight words into this. <laughs> so I told you, man, Piper spent 13 sermons. And so we're just shooting to finish this up before Jesus comes back. All right, so let's round out verse 1. Set apart for the gospel of God. In Galatians 1, 13 through 15, Paul gave a more elaborate explanation of this. He said, You have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy them. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I may preach him among the Gentiles. So before Paul was even born, God had this plan for him. He was set apart for the gospel. All right, let's continue on. Like I said, we got like 15 minutes here. So we, got to, we got to start boogieing. All right, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, who was descended of David according to the flesh, right? So all throughout the Old Testament, we are told of this promised Messiah that would come. People were separated from God because of their sin. And God gave them all these pictures throughout the Old Testament. And he perfectly described who the Messiah was. He even told them that he would come through the lineage of David. Jeremiah 23, 5 through 6, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. And he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name of which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Psalm 132, 11, The Lord swore to David a sure oath from which, uh, from which he will not turn back. One of the sons of your body I will set on your throne. And in the genealogy of Matthew 1, sure enough, we saw that Jesus, this promised Messiah, came through the lineage of David. So Paul is it, like iterating them, right? These people don't know him. He's like, this is my gospel. This is your gospel. We are on the same page here. And then we see moving on, and he was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. And Hebrews 1.3 says this, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So this is what Paul is trying to establish with them, right? He's just trying to say, look, we're on the same page. We can partner here. And then we see him, uh, then we see him rounded out with this. He said, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name, among the nations, including you who are called to belong to Christ. Paul is committed to his calling to bring about the obedience of faith. But for what? For the sake of the name. For Jesus Christ. John Stott had this to say on this point, and I was like, I can't say it any better. So I'm just going to read it for you. Uh, it's not on the screen, but I read this earlier this week, and it just, it just blew my mind, and it, it really convicted me. He said, why did Paul desire to bring the nations to obedience of faith? It was for the sake of the glory and honor of Christ's name. If therefore God desires every knee to bow to Jesus and every tongue to confess to him, so should we. We should be jealous, as scripture sometimes put it, for the honor of his name, troubled when it remains unknown, hurt when it is ignored, indignant when it is blasphemed, and all the time anxious and determined that it shall be given the honor and glory which are due to it. And this is where it really gets good. The highest of all missionary motives is neither obedience to the Great Commission, as important as that is, nor love for sinners who are alienated and perishing, strong as that incentive is, especially when we contemplate the wrath of God, but rather zeal, burning and passionate zeal for the glory of Christ. That's what he's talking about here. 
All right, let's finish up this introduction real quick. It says, he finishes that with, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from our God and Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, finally, we have weathered that. I think it took me like, like a quarter of the time to get through the whole, that whole second half of it as it did to get through like the first eight words. So I apologize for that. So if you have any questions later, feel free to ask me about it. But Paul lets the Romans know that his calling in the gospel is what he is committed to. And it's easy for us to just look at this and kind of go, well, good for him. He, he established it here well. While Paul's conversion can often seem super miraculous to us, and while he, he was called to be an apostle, ultimately Paul's story and your story and my story are all the same. What's Paul's story? Paul was a sinner separated from God. But God, rich in love and mercy, chose Paul. He called him and he set him apart for the gospel. And now we see Paul living that out. Right? We see Paul going to the nations with the gospel. What's your and my story? I was a sinner separated from God. But God, rich in love and mercy, chose us. He called us to himself and set us apart. And now we need to live that out. Jesus gave us our marching orders. He said, go therefore and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Like Paul, God pulled us out of darkness into light, from death to life. We too are servants of Jesus. There's no other place we can go. He has called us by name. He has set us apart for the gospel, to take the gospel to the world around us. He has placed you where you are, doing what you're doing, around who you are around, in order to bring the gospel to those, in order to bring unbelievers around you in obedience to the one true God. How are we doing with that? Are we committed to our calling as Paul was committed to his? All right, let's continue on now. We see that was the introduction. It was Paul's commitment to his calling. Secondly, we see here thanksgiving. We see that Paul was committed to people. Let's go ahead and read from verse 8 forward again. First, I think... My God, through Jesus Christ, for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by one another's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I've often intended to come to you, but thus far I've been forbidden, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, to both wise and to the foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. So we see that Paul has this calling. If he's to go on to make disciples, that requires other people, right? If he's required to take the gospel, that requires other people. And we see his deep longing here for these people who we've never met. He's thanking them daily because he's heard about how they've come to faith. My favorite part of this that I'd really like to just hone in on really quick here is where he says, I am under obligation to both Greeks and and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. What that's to say is, I am am obligated to both the educated, and I am obligated to both the uneducated, both to the wise and to the foolish. Like Paul, God has called us to be committed to people. It's not enough for us to believe this gospel to receive this calling and keep it bottled up inside all to ourselves. It must go out 
We must commit to gathering together. We must commit to discipling the nations. The commitment to calling and thus commitment to people and thus commitment to the gospel led Paul to taking the good news of Jesus to the known world of that time. To take the gospel to those who many probably said would never believe. To share the gospel with those who weren't like him at all. We are called to let it out, to actively share the gospel with those who aren't like us. It's so easy to just want to share the gospel and build relationships with people that are similar to us. But this gospel shows no partiality. It's not a gospel for the wise. It's not a gospel for just the wise or just the wealthy. Those who are rich and those who are poor. Those who are wise and those who are foolish. How are we doing with this? Are we committed to people and not just the ones who look like us? Not just the ones who act like us? That was Paul's commitment. And we'll see why here as we move on. Thirdly, we see the theme for Romans, that is the gospel. We see here that Paul is committed to the gospel. Verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. At this point, it begs the question. Well, I'm sure some of us are aware of it. Some of us probably aren't. I've said the gospel probably like a hundred times now. So we can't continue on without addressing this question of what is the gospel? Let's go ahead and let's look ahead to where we'll be in a couple months. Let's look ahead to Romans 5. I think this is the, the, probably the, the, the clearest place that we can, we can read the gospel here in the New Testament. In Romans 5. And in verse 6, we read, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained and have now received reconciliation. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is counted where there is no, or sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even those, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if of one man's trespass death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to many, led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came to increase trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life. 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the gospel. I mentioned it in my prayer earlier. God made everything. It was perfect. It was good. Man didn't like it. Man wanted to be like God, wanted to be equal with God. Adam rebelled against God. He did what God had forbidden him to do. And that threw us all into condemnation. But it wasn't just Adam's sin, right? Like we continue in that even now. We continue on in that sin. But God just wasn't going to leave us there in that. Because of the love with which he loved us before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1 says, he made a plan for our redemption. And this Jesus came and lived the life that we were utterly unable to do, right? Like the law never saved anybody. All the law did was expose our great, did was expose our great need for a savior. Jesus died the death that we deserved for sin. He took all of our wrath upon himself. And if we are believing that, if we are trusting that, we have a hope that goes beyond the grave. We have a hope beyond this temporal world. This is the gospel that Jesus came to save sinners. This is the gospel. But Paul says he's unashamed of it. Have you ever found yourself ashamed of the gospel. We know what we've been called to do. We know who we've been called to, but we often shrink back. Let's put it this way. Maybe, maybe, maybe you think you're not ashamed, but maybe we're embarrassed of what other people think about our faith. Maybe we're embarrassed to share our faith with other people because of what they may think. Or maybe, I think a lot of us have been at this place, maybe we feel like we don't know enough to share the good news of Jesus. Because what if someone asks a question and we don't know the answer? Have you been that person? Have you been in that position? I have an off, and, and I have, I've been there often. And guess what? The Apostle Paul, right? The guy who wrote the majority of the New Testament, he had been there too. I'm so grateful for my brother Nick Staley pointing this verse out to me earlier this week. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, 3, I was, to, this is to the Corinthian church now, he says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And I just said it like, I've, I've been ashamed as well. I've doubted the provision. I've doubted the power of the gospel. It's literally the position that I found myself in last night. As I was preparing this sermon throughout this week, I was wrestling with it. I was feeling weak in fear and trembling. Let me back up. I knew that this sermon was going to be a big undertaking, right? We've got these 17 verses. We're introing this brand new sermon series. And so I set aside a bunch of extra time to work on it. And I ended up this week spending twice as much time as I've ever spent on a sermon. And I only felt more confused and I only felt more conflicted. You see, I was worried more about what everyone else would think. I was worried. What if they don't? What if I waste everybody's time? What if I'm not clear enough? What are people going to think of me? But then I read the rest of that verse. And the rest of that verse says this. Let's start at the beginning. It says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Sometimes we get really caught up in our heads, don't we? 
It's like we think that we have to say just the right thing. We have to do just the right thing for others to come to faith. As if the power is in us. The power, my friends, is in the gospel. All we need to do is open our mouths. And that's what I'm here to do this morning. Romans 1, 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Think of it this way. If we're honest with ourselves, we usually think the worst of ourselves, don't we? Like we sometimes feel like nobody else is struggling the way that we're struggling. Nobody else has the sins that we have sins. Everybody else has freedom, but we don't feel that. You know who else didn't feel that? Once again, the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul called himself the chief among all sinners. That's what he believed. But he also knew that the gospel was sufficient to save him. So if the gospel is sufficient to save him, if the gospel is sufficient to save you and I, how much more can it be for the, those who we want to share our faith with? For those who we want to share the gospel with? We have nothing to fear. God is sovereign. The gospel is strong enough. It's powerful enough to put us in right standing with God. How much more ought we trust that it is capable to do the same thing for our loved ones? To do the same thing for our coworkers, do the same thing for our neighbor. This is what 1 Corinthians 1.18 says. The word of the cross is foolishness. It is folly. But to who? To those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So what is the secret to being unashamed of the gospel? What is the secret to overcoming the fear of sharing this message with the world. It's that the gospel itself is the power for salvation. It's not dependent upon you and I. If it was, we'd just screw it up. Let's be honest with ourselves. Verse 17. Verse 17. It says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The righteous shall live by faith. Verse 17 says that, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. And all that we need to do is place our faith in this gospel and we obtain a righteousness that is not of our own. This is the gospel. We see here, God gave Paul a calling. God gave Paul a people and God gave him the gospel to share. The question then is if we are going to be obedient as Paul is obedient. Are we going to be obedient to that calling? Are we going to be faithful to the people we've been called to share the gospel with? And are we going to be unashamed as Paul was unashamed? Because the gospel itself is the power of God unto salvation. Will you pray with me? Father God, we thank you that you are able to work in spite of wretched sinners like us. And Lord, I am so sorry for how often I make it about me and about my ability to communicate your scriptures. Lord, all I knew, need to do is to read it aloud and you create the increase. God, I believe that you are actively at work drawing people unto yourself. Lord, you were doing all the hard work. You bore all the wrath. You bore all our sin. You have come to reconcile us. You've given us a calling. You've called us to a people, and you've given us your gospel. So Lord, will you empower us now to move forward unashamed of your gospel? Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.